Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are going to be talking with horticulture educator Ryan Pankow in Champaign-Urbana, all about a brand new website that Illinois Extension is going to be unveiling, or I, I, I should say has unveiled this week. Um, so he is going to be here with us to chat all about this new website, and it's about pollinators. I'm excited to talk about this. And someone who I know is excited to talk about this, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. How are you doing? I am doing just great on this uh, spring day here in May. It's it's uh, it's a lovely day. It's been raining, seems like kind of often. Uh, I needed to pause raining so I can do some stuff outside. Um but but I'm also getting a mouthful of buffalo gnats every time I walk out the door. So it's uh, maybe not a bad thing that I'm stuck indoors right now. How about yourself? Yeah, a little bit of a trade-off there. Yeah, I, same thing. We started uh, redoing our deck, and we have a big hole in our deck because we got chased away, chased inside by the rain. So mm -hmm. these dry out so we don't have a child fall through the deck. <laughs> what a better, there's no better place to explore, I think, than underneath the deck if you're a child. I mean, how about that? So we just, just make we... sure you don't close them in there so we need to find some small animal skeletons and stuff under there so they were excited just put them on display in the bedrooms there yeah <laughs> <laughs> well uh speaking of doing yard work i know that both you and and i in our very own yards we are are working to incorporate more pollinator friendly plants and um uh, we have been working on this website with our, our guests today, uh, Ryan, for for uh, for some time, and so I, I'm excited to chat with him. So I think we go ahead and bring him in on this. So uh, horticulture educator Ryan Pankow in the Champaign County office. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, it's really been a pleasure working with you both on this great project, so I'm excited to talk about it today. Exactly. We are excited to uh, unveil this uh, this website. Um, and so let, let's go ahead and, and just kind of kick this off up, up top right now um, that the Illinois Extension Hort team spearheaded by you, Mr. Ryan Pankow, um, has put together a website called Illinois Pollinators. Uh, the web link address is IllinoisIllinatorPollinators.org. We will put it right here. Put it right here in the video feed uh, so uh, people watching can uh, can see that. IllinoisPollinators.org. We're going to have that uh, ingrained in your brain at, by the end of this show. But Ryan, um, we'll dive into what is this website here in just a second. But why did you want to create this website? What was the catalyst that got the ball rolling? Well, sure. Yeah, that's it's actually a pretty great story behind it. And and you guys were there for for all of this. But um you know, it started with, with all of us as horticulture educators kind of talking about this issue of pollinators. I mean, so many of us are addressing it in our programming and in things we do in the field. And uh, there was just great interest amongst the team to, you know, develop more information we can share with the public more readily about pollinators. I guess um, I kind of stumbled into this role of project leader. I mean, I'm just really happy to land here, but uh, the way that I kind of got elected or uh, I don't know, like volunt voluntold as project leader, is that uh, my local unit um, has the Pollinator Pockets program, which is, um, you know, it's it's a, a garden registry, essentially. So if folks plant a pollinator habitat on their property, w whatever size it is, uh, they can register with us as a pollinator pocket. And essentially, we send them a nice little metal sign. I'm sure I've got one of those hanging up here. Nice little metal sign that says pollinator pockets. Uh, and it's an outreach program for us. You know, like we, it, it helps the, the folks that install the pollinator habitat learn about it and they get this fancy sign, their neighbors ask them questions about it. It generates, you know, conversation around that pollinator planting. So um, some of my uh, desire with the team was just to have some thoughts on how can we further develop pollinator pockets. It's, you know, it's working fine, but it hasn't had an update in a few years and just, that's where the conversation all really kind of started is Ryan just wanting some input from other educators on pollinator pockets. But the more we talked about it, uh, the more there was interest in really beyond just updating the pollinator pockets program, you know, developing a website of our own that, you know, had Illinois specific information, because as, as all of us knew from our own personal research, there's not websites out there that really have a ton of like 
Illinois focused specific information on uh, on pollinators, the plants they use, how you install them in the landscape, uh, how, how you can um, you know better introduce these plants to your community, to your friends, to your own yard. Um, and so that's really how it all started. And, you know, uh, we, we've had just a ton of folks on the project I hope to mention today as we kind of talk about the website, but lots of contributions from Extension, from some of our partners uh, in the review phase. And it's just, uh, it's grown into just one of the greatest projects I've worked on here at Extension. And who knew from those first days, <laughs> you know, in, in Hort meetings where, where we kind of started talking about this, that it would grow to this. Bit of that careful what you wish for <laughs> type situation there <laughs> definitely definitely all right so you you kind of hinted at some of the different sections on there but I, I think we're you know we're talking about doing this episode talking about you know we want to go through section by section about what that offers so say you know we've got a homeowner I'm a homeowner and I've I've heard of pollinators but that's about the extent of my knowledge I um, you know kind of where would I I start and I would say you probably start out the most important and the best section of the website. Your section, Ken, you mean? <laughs> well, it is the one, you know, when you open up the website, uh, you can see right across your screen these colored buttons that have the different sections identified. And it's kind of neat how all of this came about from our standpoint. You know, we all know the content that went into this website, but gosh, to organize it into a thing. You know, other than just the, the stuff we all know, that was what the big challenge came here. And it was actually um, Andrew Holsinger, one of our fellow educators, that suggested we create this mind map. Do you guys remember this way back oh at the start? Oh my gosh, yes. that was a while ago, yes. <laughs> that's that's what started all of this. And if you looked at that mind map, it was just this circular diagram with, you know, the you know Illinois Pollinators website in the center. And around it were these bubbles, these five bubbles that represent you know, those major um, headers across there when you open up the website, the first one at the left is what are pollinators. So that's the section that, you know, Ken did a lot of work with others on. Uh, Ken was really kind of the driving force behind that section. And it's it's focused on the insects, the pollinators themselves. What are they? Um, and, and, you know, Ken, you can help me go through some of the different um, designations there, but we have, if you click on that, uh, what are pollinators section, then you see right away, there's a buttons pop up for all the different categories of pollinators. And so uh, between Ken worked on this one and, and Jamie, one of our, ed our court educator from up in Cook County, and then Brody Dunn, one of our campus specialists, you guys kind of all developed out this information. Uh, Kelly also, uh, past horticulture educators, also instrumental in writing some of these sections. But um, yeah, Ken, what can you tell? How did you guys find this information or where did... How, how did you organize it down to the size it is? Because I know it was huge at the start that they had vast amounts of info that you're really just seeing a portion of what they wrote that became part of the website. Yeah, so we, we kind of started off and hit, we want to get the main groups of pollinators. We've got, you know, the, the ones everybody thinks of bees, butterflies, but including moths, which pollinate at night, so they're overlooked a lot of times. Flies, um, again, are pollinate quite a bit, but we overlook them. Uh, beetles would be another one that, that get overlooked a lot. So we, we kind of want to hit all of those, not just focus on, you know, the pretty things that everybody talks about. And then, and give people information on, you know, what they look like, what they do, um, and things like that. And yeah, like you said, we're, we're just kind of scratching the surface and hopefully down down the road here, we'll add more stuff to it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for additions. We'll, we'll talk about, I think, at the end, kind of the future of the site. But um, gosh, you guys have even information already queued up and ready to kind of go that can go into additional pages on the insects portion. But um, but I think that's really uh, what, you, you know, you can, some of the other portions of our website, you can find bits and pieces of this at other places on the internet. But um, as far as the insect info, that's what I found in my own research was really hard to find. So I am excited to see what you guys can add, you know, in coming years. And I mean, what's already there is a great reference. And it's just hard as a gardener, as a homeowner, as just a member of the general public to kind of wrap your head around what these pollinators are. And I think we do a pretty good job of kind of summarizing that into the categories, different insects, and even you know, not quite always down to species, because as we talked about in developing this site, 
gosh, if you go down to species, we start getting into thousands of species. You know, you know, mm -hmm. insects are incredibly diverse, even here in Illinois. You know, you don't think about, about that. But um, just but but I really am just super thrilled with how that portion of the website has kind of you know come together to really represent, you know, the the really important info there amongst the different insects group groups that are major players in pollination. So uh, a lot of great photography went into that as well, that section. So as we move from section to section, um, as you had mentioned, Ryan, kind of our target audience for this, homeowners, you know, home gardeners. Um, I, I would say if you are a, a PhD entomologist, this might be a little, you know, basic for you. But 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 really, we did have this reviewed by PhD entomologists too, by the way. So um, and they were they were really pushing for those species specific things. We were like, yeah, we got to pull it back a little bit. We have to make this accessible to kind of a broader audience here. Um, and that's when I get into this second section here uh, about the importance of pollinators. Now, dive into that because I think it, it really gets into sort of the, the details or the nitty gritty of um, the processes happening here and, and how this impacts us, us as humans. Yeah, yeah, it's really, you know, the section about like, why should we care about this? You know, so, mm -hmm. so, they're, so they're bugs flying around. Why, why should we care about this? Uh, but, you know, right away you see, you know, some of the references to our food, our own food supply as humans, you know, and pollinators are this, you know, they, they provide this vital service. They pollinate flowers, they create fruits, they create food uh, for us. But, um, you know, it also goes into just some of the ecological aspects of what pollinators do, where, you know, native plant communities, you don't have seed production without these insects. So you don't have a plant population that can always perpetuate itself, you, you know, so it even, so it talks about that, you know, uh, for us as humans, what does it mean for in an ecosystem level, what does it mean? Um, but um, it also talks, we do have another great section here that I think is just some of the best info on the website uh, that we call just what can you do? It's a button that, you know, as you kind of scroll down a little bit, there's a button that says, what can you do? And we've listed, you know, a number of actions here. So almost 20, I guess, 16 different actions that you can do that are just really easy things to a lot of times to adapt to your home landscape, to your situation. Um, and, and this is based off of what research has told us, you know, what, what, what is affecting pollinators? What, what, you know, what can we change and what we do that's uh, going to help promote, promote their numbers, uh, help them stay healthy. And so, um, you know, we probably should do a little bit of framing of the problem too. And I know, um, Ken, you can speak to this as well as any of us, but, um, you know, pollinators are in decline worldwide. I mean, that's, that's the uh, essential message here. And, and what, why everyone's talking about pollinators so much is that, you know, A, they, they support these, um, you know, eco native plant ecosystems. They support, you know, non-native food crops we brought to this continent and moved around the planet and, you know, rely on for food for us, for animals. Uh, and when we see, uh, you know, all the research recently that's been published on their, their decline and really alarming numbers from around the globe of just insects in general, not necessarily pollinators, uh, there's a real need for conservation. So, um, so this this section, importance of pollinators, really talks about it, it. Frames that you know need for conservation and kind of what we can do. Uh, these sixteen steps here, what you can do under the importance of pollinators section, highly valuable. Um, you know, and, and maybe you, listener, viewer, you get it. But if you live with someone or your neighbor or, or whoever, you know, this, these are steps very easy to, to take, um, to talk about, you know, one thing is just turn your lights off at night. Yeah. That's, that's one yeah. of the, one of the recommendations. And, um, there, there is a ton of information here supporting these recommendations. So that very neat section. I'm yes, I'm, I'm getting more excited as we dive deeper into this uh, website. And I would say, you know, with, with some of those tips, you know, think about your typical suburban urban landscape. It's turf, maybe a tree here and there, maybe some shrubs. So it's it's kind of a, you know, from an insect or pollinator perspective, it's kind of a barren wasteland. Um, so you know that those tips you do get into some of that. And then our next section, which I think is probably what most people 
um, are going to be using the website for mm -hmm. um, maybe the, the plants pollinators use. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about what all went into that. So yeah, the plants pollinators use section. This this is the section that's focused on those the plant relationship. Those plants that pollinators either use in their larval forms as a food source, or as adults, um, you know they get a, they get food from the flowers. You know, you know from pollen or nectar produced by flowers, and that's this process of pollination. They're tr actually lured in by this food source, and inadvertently they spread pollen pollen uh, you know across the different plant parts to fertilize an egg essentially and create those fruits. Uh, but what, um, and I, I'd like to say, you know, everybody on the website team kind of contributed to this section. So all of us, we had a lot of discussions about this because uh, this is where in our first year, you know, on this project, our first year of progress here that we can show, uh, a lot of the data went into it, you know, a large database of plants. and. They've resulted in pretty much a, you know, the, the main part of this section is a plant selector tool where it allows you to filter um, all the plants in our database by different categories. And, you know, it starts with uh, the site conditions. So by shade, part, you know, part shade or sun, you know, you can sort these plants. And by clicking on the button, these buttons are really easy to see on the website. By clicking on those buttons, it instantly sorts our list by, you know, whether it's a shade, whatever you've clicked on there. So, we start with the, the um, light and soil conditions, and then we move into different plant characteristics you can sort by. So you can sort by the month that the plant likely blooms. Uh, you can sort by the bloom color, and then you can sort by the size of the plant. So, those, so we have about five different categories there you can sort our plant list by. And the reason being, um, you know, for first off, you know, pretty obvious why we care about site conditions. You want the right plant in the right location. But uh, some of these characteristics of flowers relate back to Ken's section on what are pollinators and what, what flowers pollinators use um, and different times of year. So, so different pollinators we know use different colored flowers. Uh, you know, if you really want a, a great pollinator garden, you want something blooming as many months out of the year as you can. So that's why we care, you know, what flower color to sort by and what month. And then finally, you know, the size of the plant is pretty self-explanatory. It has to fit in the space you have. So that's another kind of characteristic that relates to, you know, where you're planting in site selection. But it's designed to help you um, either if, if you're either, say you're missing anything that blooms early in the season. You know, that's, that's a common thing. A lot of gardens are that through the middle part of summer. They've got nice blooms. But, you know, at the tail end of the season, at the start of the season, you might be missing something. You can quickly sort our list to find those plants to fill in an existing planting. Uh, but also, if you know, if you're just looking for, you, you know, what am I missing? As you start to go through the water pollinator section, you see what some of these different pollinators need. You may realize there's certain pollinators you, you you have no plant to offer. You know, based on the size of the flower, the shape, the color that they that they uh, that they need. And actually, to go back to Ken's section once. One minute here, back to the water pollinator section. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a chart of those flower traits versus the type of pollinators they use. That's like one of the main things on that, you know, the water pollinators page when you pop in there, and that can give you an idea of what types of, you know, plants and flowers uh, might support different pollinator groups. But um, anyway, you can select different plants. You can select down to the list that you want based off our characteristics. We also have a little search bar if you just want to search by common name, scientific name. Uh, but essentially, the plant selector tool narrows it down to some some thumbnails. We call them, you know, a lot of little pictures with the plant name that you can then click on, and then that takes you to an individual plant page that then has all that information about the plant. Uh, you know, more detailed information about its growing requirements. Uh, we definitely list the different pollinators it supports. You know, that was a big goal of this project was to, to link, you know, the pollinating insect over here to that plant that it uses. So a homeowner or a gardener or someone like us can get that plant in the landscape. Uh, so we definitely talk about that, but there's a lot of just different information. We have a nice photo gallery for each plant so you can see what it looks like and visualize it. And, um, and that's kind of the the plants pollinators use section in a nutshell is essentially this filtering tool that gets you down to individual plant pages that can help you either learn more or plan what might go in your landscape. So, and then if I remember right, didn't we 
kind of focus on the ones that are relatively easy to find commercially. So we're not, we don't have any like oddball things that you got to go to one store in the United States that sells it. You can find these relatively easy. Yeah, we did. We um, actually had some uh, some data from um, a researcher at the Illinois Natural History Survey, Jack Zinnen, shared this large data set that he had of different nurseries around the Midwest. And I can't remember now, I think it was around five, four or 500 nurseries he surveyed to look at, you know, what native plants are most commonly carried. Uh, so that allowed us to, yes, definitely sort our list beyond, you know, for me, I started in native plants as a biologist in the field. And so th that translated into landscaping for me later. But to me, when I think of a cool native plant, I think of really rare things, you know, that I used to seek out. Well, you know, if you look at Jack's list of commercial availability, you're not finding the really rare things because they're typically, I mean, it's just a hard plant to produce in a production setting, you know, you know to get to grow, to produce on a mass scale, is one of the things, um, and you know, another, some, some of the plants are hard to come by too, uh, in general, just to, to have a seed or whatever method you need to reproduce those plants. So yeah, you're right, Ken, we, we did kind of have to hone our list a bit because you know the, the original plant list we just created at the start that we thought we would develop information on was many hundreds of plants, you know, that we had to narrow down to what can we get on the website in a year. Um, I don't want to get too much into our future plans yet in the podcast here, but we do plan to add additional plants. And, we're and that's what we're trying to select for is plants that you can find commercially and uh, they're fairly available. And we give, you know, each plant based on um, Jack's data and then our own experience as um, gardeners, a commercial availability rating, you know, and it's really just a scale of not very, you know, not as available, occasionally available, or readily available. You know, we have kind of like three levels. Um, and so we did, again, yeah, didn't want to put plants on there you can't find. Uh, at this time, our entire plant database is native plants. And, um, you know, the reason being, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of information that tells us native plants are the best we can install to support pollinators and, and across their life cycle not just as adults. A lot of us think of those pollinators that are going to flower, flower to flower doing their job. That's the adult insect stage. Uh, those larval stages are also important as well. And so, you know, we, I think we talk about, you know, caterpillars in general a lot as those, the lar larval stage we're trying to support. Uh, they feed on, you know, foliage and, and, and other plant parts, not necessarily, flowers don't have much to do with some of those larval stages. So, uh, we know from research that native plants kind of provide the best support there. Um, you know, we talk about non-natives a little bit on our website um, in a few spots where we do mention them with respect to producing flowers. So, so there's non-natives that can produce adult food, and that's that's a good thing. But uh, we focused on natives because they support across the life cycle. Um, and, and our plans in the future are to add additional native species and I mean, kind of going back to commercial availability, uh, as you both know, one of the biggest challenges in gardening with natives is finding the plants. You know, where do you get them at? So uh, we're trying to think about all those things as we build our plant database up over the years. Yeah, the having a commercial availability, I think, is very important, especially as we dovetail into this next section, which... It's like, it's like, Ryan, you had a very deliberate uh, design intention here of how this all feeds into each other. But uh, once we, we move from the plants that pollinators use into the pollinator habitat design section, which I, I will admit, I could probably spend all day looking at plants pollinators use, but I have a bigger vested stake in the pollinator habitat design section uh, being the one that I, I primarily worked on. So as we we move into the habitat design, uh, when someone clicks on on this tab, what what will they find here? Yeah, so the the habitat design is really uh, it's kind of where the rubber meets the road. It's it's the cool part, you know. Of, of here's how plants work in the landscape. So it essentially gives you a lot of tips. You guys have added some just great tips on how to have a really uh, helpful, beneficial pollinator habitat. But we also have some pre-planned garden designs, you know, so, so an actual design, a layout for, you know, shade, sun, or then we have what we call a bioswale design, which, you know, is an area that has 
is wetter, you know, has some water moving through it. It's meant to function on the landscape as, as a place for water to move through. So there's different wet loving species in there. And um, Chris, you can talk about the designs even better than I can for sure. But uh, that's that's essentially the point is uh, of this section is when you get to the point of uh, being ready to install that pollinator habitat, here's how you do it. And here's some examples of, of what you might install. Yeah, I, I worked uh, with Lane Kenoki, and he's he's one of our specialists on campus. Um, Lane, his training is in landscape architecture, and so he put together these these pre-planned guard designs. And and our idea here is really just to focus on these characteristics that a lot of people are dealing with in their yards, from full sun, full shade. But then another thing that we also get questions about, and where this bioswale idea came from. Is is coming up with planting things like right of ways, ditches, uh, things that are have a bit more soil moisture than others, and so that that's kind of the where that comes from. And if people want to, they can um, they can install these plans exactly as they are. That was not ever really our intention. Um, you know, we want people to modify them, change them to best suit their site. Now we did try to stick to some of those design. Um, best practices, you know, planting in odd numbers, clustering, grouping, or mass planting. Um, and, and then also, you know, we, we, we have little flagstone walkways, you know, we want people to, to move into these gardens, to be a part of these gardens. And so, um, yeah, they, they are, they are meant to be used as is or modified, you know, it, it, it's really up to, to the, to the homeowner or the gardener, how they would want to employ these. And, and so, so Lane was, was, it, pivotal in putting these together. Another great part about this is, as you mentioned, with commercial availability, what if you can't find these plants? Well, we do have alternatives to each and every plant on there. Um, and, and every plant that you can click on a plant, and it will go right back to the plants pollinators use for a description of that plant specifically, so you can know if that's the one that you want to put in that space. Yeah, I think I, I've most used you know, I really like this idea of a, a published design and, and working off that to to just make it easy for the homeowner. And, but I guess just just like you say, it's really versatile. And, and the ways I think I've kind of used it in my own landscape because I don't have these vast areas I'm putting in a giant new chunk. I'm kind of renovating. I, I'm adding some areas to my own landscaping, but I'm kind of renovating and working around existing plant material that was there. And but as you do that, um, the designs are nice because they have. You guys have really thought about, you know, the plant groupings. Uh, first off, the uh, all those designs would include a season of blooms. So you've got things that bloom across the season, but also texturally, how do those plants kind of fit together? And so if you only have a little corner of this, you know, that that little corner of plants, although it may not have a season of blooms, you, you can kind of adapt the three or four plants around there. Those will work well together. You know, you guys have thought about that and put time into uh, planning that arrangement. So you don't necessarily have to do the whole thing. You can pick a section or you can even key in on your favorite plant from that that you're looking to add. And, and what have they put right around it? You know, so I can add a few more things around it that work on the landscape. So uh, really pretty versatile designs. And I, yeah, I really like how those have turned out and, and really display all, all those elements you talk about of good design, which are, are kind of listed under garden tips there. Yep. Um, another section I'll point out that I think has a lot of info folks can use is if you are developing a larger swath and you're, you know, how do you start one of these pollinator gardens? There's a whole sidebar there that talks about all the methods to get rid of turf <laughs> is really what it kind of focuses on. <laughs> and, and so like Ken alluded to earlier, these vast swaths of turf in urban areas are not much pollinator habitat. So that's what we're really trying to promote is if if you can, if you can peck away at that front, front yard or backyard and take away some of that turf area and add some of these diverse mixes of plants, that's what pollinators really need on a landscape mm -hmm. level. You know, I mean, it, and even more so than we can do in all of our own yards, We they need vast tracts of this. That's what we had before, you know, European settlement, when we started to divide everything up and make crop fields and cities and all the stuff that that's here today, um, there was vast tracts of pollinator habitat. That's what we need. Um, so anyway, uh, built, you know, that section on how to start, you know, talks about how to control that turf, get it out of the way, uh, so your pollinator plants can come in behind it. Very good point, Ryan, as we are right in the middle of no mow May, which I always say, mow your lawn, but tear a part of it up so that instead of providing habitat for May, 
we provided for all year long. So let's just let's ditch no mo may and let's do pollinator year round. So yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, I think there's also, you know, I think we talk about it somewhere on the website, but just um, you can relax your mowing a little bit, though. Let yep. some things flower. You know, I I think, you know, not to go all the way off on the tangent and no mow may, but um, <laughs> it, it's it's really probably like at least what I've concluded and in information I've gathered and talking to other educators and folks. Uh, it's probably not an awesome recommendation for Illinois. I think it originated a little further north. Where you know we're maybe talking about no mo early April or yeah. something is what it what started, our started our, in England. Oh, did and it then, start? In, and okay. then came over. Yeah. So yeah, probably already yeah, April and and June would be a better time for the Midwest. So you get your dandelions in April, clover. Oh yeah. In June. Mm -hmm. There are the yeah. dandelions and uh and violets. I love in my yard. It's kind of the contrasting, you know, purple and gold. That's our <laughs> mm -hmm. my school colors for our our local schools. So. Uh, or I, I like drunken mowing and now I'm not literally drunk, but it looks like you're drunk oh. because I avoid the patches of clover. I avoid the patches of creeping Charlie. I let them bloom after they're done blooming. I'll come in, mow them down, mow the violets down. And it's, and, but I also, I, 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 I mow set at the mower deck set high, uh, four inches. That's what I've gone to. And the lawn looks good. The dandelions can still bloom. The creeping Charlie still blooms. Uh, it, it's a it's a more diverse lawn, and so we're we're getting on a tangent here. But uh, yeah, sorry to take us down this pathway uh, of no, mowing. <laughs> but it's it's good points, and I do the same thing. I kind of call it selective mowing. Mm -hmm. You know, just kind of mow the spots where there's not something blooming. And you know, uh, maybe last point to make on this is just uh, I know I've I've seen criticism of this recommendation. Like, why are you recommending? you know, not letting non-natives bloom in your yard as pollinator habitat, that's not very good habitat. Well, uh, the point of all this is that's that's better than turf with nothing. And, and we're definitely not saying that simply by not mowing some dandelions in your yard, we're, we're going to support pollinators and that's the solution because it's not, you know, like I mentioned earlier, it's really vast tracts of habitat is what these insects need. But we're just, what our website's focused on is just what every little inch of What's every little inch of things we can do in the urban setting, in your yard, in your landscape to, to provide little chunks of that? So um, I always want to be clear about that when you start to talk about not mowing. Not saying that's the solution to the problem, but that's yeah. a piece. You know, that's a piece. And that's a key timing of spring uh, when those those things are flowering that we don't have a lot of landscape plants a lot of times. Uh, it's mostly trees and shrubs in the landscape then that are supporting pollinators. But if we can add some of those you know, low growing flowers, that's a different habitat element uh, in the landscape. So, all right, so what's our next section here then guys? Uh, community science and education would be the next section. Um, and uh, it's this, this section has a lot of great things you can do that aren't related necessarily to planting a pollinator plant, uh, but a lot of the community science type things are observing the insects. So I, I really like um, a lot of those activities. We've listed in this section, um, just, just a, a, there's a great list of different community science projects you can participate in. Uh, some are extension led like I pollinate, but others like, you know, I pollinate pollinator pockets are kind of some of the extension projects. We talked about those earlier. Uh, but, you know, Bee Spotter, iNaturalist, uh, Monarch Watch, some of these other you know, pollinator related uh, projects that you can kind of contribute to the community science coming out of this are listed. Um, another uh, big section there is uh, the youth education section. So, um, you know, Brittany Haig is kind of the educator that led this section um, with help from others, but um, some of those are, you know, actual, you know, educational sessions that Brittany has done and developed over the years and uh, was nice enough to format for our website and get in there. Uh, I, I imagine we'll probably add to those over time, but those are great. You, you know, you can, it's a simple PDF you can download and take right to the youth group you're working with and have a fun activity to do related to pollinators. And then uh, we also have um, what you can do for pollinators also pops up here. You know, that's the same section we kind of talked about earlier under importance of pollinators, but um, you know, that that list of things you can do is also part of you know, the community science and educational aspect of pollinator conservation. So uh, we kind of have it showing up in two different spots on the website. That means it's important. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it is. It, it's the things you can do, you know? All right. I think we've got one more section. Um, and, and I like this one because, you know, I, even though I work for U of I, I don't necessarily know what's going on over there all the time. <laughs> um, that's the, the pollinator research uh, part of it. Yeah, so this section features um, research that's going on right here at University of Illinois related to pollinators. So uh, it kind of summarizes the different, you know, labs that are actually looking at pollinators and researching them in the field, uh, summarizes the, you know, the key, the key folks in charge of those labs and kind of what they do, plus, you know, some other other folks from the National History Survey, um, from the NRES department, you know, we, we kind of list everybody that we could collect uh, that does research on pollinators here at Illinois, because just like Ken said, even though we work for University of Illinois, it's hard to track down who all is doing this research or to find all the relevant papers. So this would allow you to go by, by individual researcher or lab and figure out what they're working on and, and uh, understand some of that research here at Illinois. And uh, you know, I'd like to definitely give kudos to, to Brody Dunn, our pollinator specialist on campus. He really was the connection that helped build this portion of the site where we as Hort educators are off campus. We're out in the county field offices, so we don't have, that's why we struggle to make some of these campus connections sometimes with researchers. So uh, Brody really helped us kind of get all this information in one place and develop it. And hopefully I'm hoping he can help us keep it current and updated. And, um, and I don't know, that's kind of a nice segue into some of our future plans if we're ready to talk about that, or is anything else on the pollinator research page you guys I, would like to mention? I think, Ryan, that the pollinator research page, you know, if, if the website as a whole is somebody dipping their toe or jumping into the, the pool of pollinators, the pollinator research page, that's moving into maybe a bit more advanced stage, and that allows the user to go in and they can go to these people's lab web pages and they list their research. In some cases, you can read and download these published articles. And so if you really, maybe you're, you've are you gone from, from beginner to a bit more advanced uh, in terms of your pollinator knowledge, this is that next step right here and opens a whole another gateway of, and, and you'll, you'll step into this threshold realizing, boy, there's a lot to know. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so really everything we've published on the website is based in science. It's just mm -hmm. not necessarily research that happened at University of Illinois, too. So um, that's what I like about it is, you, you know, if you go out and and I know your your average just person that's barely getting their feet wet in, in the pollinator, uh, in all the pollinator info probably isn't interested in, you know, specific research papers. But uh, for me, I really am. That's what I, you know, all three of us look at for our jobs here at, at Illinois Extension. We're trying to relay that info to the public. Um, it's not easy to boil it down to what's from Illinois or about Illinois. So that's what's really nice about this page. Um, it's it's maybe something that was on all of our wish lists for somewhere on the internet too. And I'm just excited to get to put it in into perspective here in one spot. Um, but talking about future plans for the website, um, you know, what we and, and just this just popped up with the uh, pollinator research page. Uh, we do hope to develop some kind of research spotlights where we can work with some of these uh, labs on campus to kind of have individual pages that talk about different projects and conclusions and are hopefully, you know, hopefully help to kind of boil it down and, you know, help that beginner or that, you know, person that's not into all the science as much find some meaning, you know, what, how do these things translate into what I'm doing in my yard or, or pollen, you know, what I care about with, related to pollinators. So uh, that's definitely a future plan for this page and it'll be in the next, the next couple of years. So it, as, as we get into this discussion of, of future plans, um, we do have two more years that we'll be updating and adding info to this website, still in kind of the development page where, of course, development stage, where of course we'll, we'll maintain the information forever for as long as we can but uh we're really we have a, our team is going to stay together and continue to add info for the next two years um of, of you know again kind of a heavy development stage so that's what we're talking about is in the next couple of years what are we going to add so ken why don't we go back up to the water pollinators page and do you want to talk about you know what your group kind of at plans to add there in in the coming year uh, so one thing we're going to add, and we heard this from several reviewers, uh, is add hummingbirds. 
on there because uh, they oh, will yeah. do some do some pollinators. We focused on the insects for this first go around, uh, but add some stuff on hummingbirds and what they're attracted to and all of that stuff. Uh, and I think in addition to that is just adding some of those maybe species profiles um, or if not necessarily going on to species or like family level, a little bit larger, but drilling down a little bit on some of these different uh, pollinator groups. We've done that to some extent with the, the bees. We've gone down to mm -hmm. uh, the different the families and stuff, but you know, getting into butterflies, uh, talking about some of those commonly seen species, bees, um, probably some of the beetles as well. Talk about some of those specific species that we commonly see uh, so people can get more information about some of the stuff they're probably going to see in their landscape if they provide this habitat. Yeah, so that that I'm excited to see that too. And um, I know one thing that you all have spent a lot of time on is uh, aligning photography. And I mean, same the same can be said for the plants pollinators use section in that plants database. Uh, getting the photography is a huge hurdle and challenge. And so um, I'm excited. I know you guys actually have a lot of the, the photography in hand now. It's it's kind of starting to build out some of those more specific pages, just again, drilling down deeper into the um, you know, taxonomy of the these pollinators. But um, so that that that's gonna be a great addition. Uh for uh, importance of pollinators, um I don't know what all you know specifically we have we're gonna add to that. Uh I, I'm kind of thinking of some of the bigger items for this year, but um I'd have to kind of look now we, you know, I guess to go back to our process on all this, uh, we began with just large outlines of written content that then got boiled down into the website. So I think for importance of pollinators, we may actually have already some things written or some ideas hashed out that could be added uh, as we have time this year. But um, also to go back a step, we had a really extensive review process that happened with this website around, you know, January through about March of this year. Uh, we sent it around to other experts, you know, uh, these guys mentioned, you know, PhDs looked at this. Uh, we sent it to all the, you know, the research section, all the labs. We tried to get information in front of all the researchers here at U of I. We uh, sent it to some outside experts as well uh, from around Illinois and the Midwest that we felt like uh, if they had time, you know, kind of asking people to contribute some time for us, please uh, review this. Uh, and then we also sent it around to all of our Master Gardener and Master Nationalist volunteers around the state offering them an opportunity to review and provide comments. And so, you know, literally uh, hundreds of reviews came in over this. And I, I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, somewhere around 200 reviews were returned to us in one format or another. And so uh, we, we really tr did our best between, you know, March and our launch date, which was just, a, you know, earlier here in May, to kind of go through that and make sure and get all the all the really important things, but I think there's even another level that we'll look at with the team from that review process of you know what things could we add or change, and I think that's going to guide some of our work and especially importance of pollinators um, and you know the community science and education section. That's where I think there's more. I know there's more in our review comments that can help us guide us what you know learn what folks want to learn in those sections, but. Uh, to talk about plants pollinators use, the big uh, thing that we plan to do there is add uh, additional plants to our database. And I know what we're lacking right now are trees and shrubs. Uh, and we, you know, purposefully kind of waited on those just to kind of categorize what the group was working on in that section. And um, so this year you'll definitely see um, more trees and shrubs being added, but, you know, also herbaceous plants as well will go in. Uh, Chris mentioned in, in his section on pollinator habitat design uh, that we have some plant alternatives or recommendations in there. Uh, we'd like to develop alternatives for every plant in our list. And right now we don't have that in our database. If you go into some plants, we don't have an alternative. And I really thought that was going to be uh, pretty easy to go through our plant list and say, oh, what's, you know, butterfly weed? What's a similar plant with a similar bloom time, mm -hmm. you know, similar pollinator value? And it just was a lot more challenging than I thought. And so that's why that um, that's on the list for this year. So adding more plants um, and, and trying to work on getting alternatives in there for all the plants. And that the alternatives recommendation also goes back to this commercial availability aspect of things where you, know, you get to the garden center with a list of your favorite plants off of our website and you may not be able to find them all. So you need to be able to pivot quickly. And or if you have one of Chris's designs printed out, 
you need to be able to pivot quickly and you know pick up those alternate alternative plants to fill out the space or to uh, provide some of that same pollinator benefit. But um, I guess as far as habitat design, Chris, what are what's your group's plans for uh, this upcoming year in, in that section? You know, in terms of some of the, the tips and things that we provided, a lot of that will stay the same. Uh, however, we do uh, want to add more of these pre-planned designs. Right now we have three. We have full sun, we have a shade garden, and we have a garden that is a high soil moisture, like a bioswale. Uh, as we develop this more, I mean, people limit what I call site characteristics. People sometimes call constraints or opportunities, but I call them characteristics. So um, you know, what, what are some of those characteristics? Slopes. That's a very common question. So what would a pollinator garden look like on a slope? Um, also looking at pollinator gardens in schools. Uh, I've seen a lot of pollinator gardens go into schools. Uh, one in particular that comes to mind, they also planted big blue stem in there. Well, after a few years, the whole thing was just big blue stem. And so creating, I think, pre-planned designs uh, with, the, with some of the maintenance and some of the ideas of some of those site characteristics in mind. So uh, look for next year, a few more of those pre-planned garden designs under pollinator habitat design. Yeah, I'm excited to see those come, come about too. Uh, and you know, another thing that is um, kind of doesn't really, I don't know where it'll fall under the different categories, but the Pollinator Pockets program we, is actually a separate web page on a different part of the extension web universe, but uh, it, it will actually get an update and we'll be coming onto the, you know, we'll get, we're gonna get it all in one place. So the Pollinator Pockets program will um, actually have its own homepage be within this website. And um, it has some existing designs too, that we're, I think we're, we'll take a look at and see if we wanna, how we wanna maybe update that, or at least, you know, bring that design into the format we have here on the website. So. Those would be some that are kind of coming, but that's another big update for this year is uh, trying to get you know pollinator pockets into this website as well and, and kind of living here uh, going forward. But um, exciting stuff in the next couple of years. Uh, this is really just, we, we launched the website. This is just the start, you know, what's to come with this information. So I'm excited to work with you guys on it. It's a living website, so it will it will change and 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 morph into into something more and even and greater than it is even now. So that is IllinoisPollinators.org. Check it out. Uh, you're going to spend all day at this website. I promise. Hopefully, you'll be sunning yourself outside doing this, so uh, you don't you're not spending all day inside. But. Well, that was a lot of great information about pollinators and where to go online in terms of where, where to find this great information. So if you want to know what are pollinators, the importance, plants that they use, habitat design, pre-planned designs, uh, it, some steps that you can take in terms of community education and even connecting with the researchers on campus. We have got all that and more on IllinoisPollinators.org. Ryan Pankow, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me guys. And thanks so much for all the stuff you contributed to this website. It's just been a pleasure working with you. Uh, what a great team of folks we have and just couldn't be more thrilled with the website we put out. So thanks guys. Thank you. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension and edited this week by Ken Johnson. A special thank you to Ken for both editing and hanging out this week with me as he does every single week talking about pollinators. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it has been a pleasure working with both of you, and thank you for steering the ship and keeping us out of the out of the rocks and all of that fun stuff. And uh, Chris, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. Hey, are you in the market to buy a house? Well, Ken and I, we're going to sit down and talk about some of those things to look for when you're buying a house in that yard, or maybe you bought a house already and you want to know what to do. We're going to go all into that for the new homeowner or maybe the new home that you are now the owner of. So uh, listeners, thank you for what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching this on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.